G'day, Johan. How are you going? Good night, Peter. Good, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, great. Thanks. Congratulations on your run at Hurdies last week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, it was a big one. Um, and I was happy to finally break through that 40 hour, 48 hour mark. Um, cause that sort of was the one outstanding for me. You know, I've been getting closer slowly, but surely. Um, and yeah, I was, uh, very, very happy to, to finally get there. Yeah, for sure. I remember the last time we actually saw each other in person was when we ran at Hysterical. And um, you ran as the assist there as well with 39 yards. So what, what do you remember about that race? The stairs at the start and yeah. uh, the, the elevation. Um, yeah. And I think, it, again, it was hot. So, you know, I think the heat was something to pay careful attention to, um, to try and stay cool between laps, even on laps, you know, with ice, ice collars and, and just colder drinks, um, you know, to try and stay cool. I think the one thing that I definitely remember and learned from that one was if I ever get in that uh, assist position again or the last two to just try and stay or hang in there for longer. I think, um, you know, I was only out there with Margie probably for two laps and then on lap three, I was done and timed out. Um, and I think I was a little bit disappointed with that, that it ended so quick. Um, but I think this weekend, the past weekend, that what i was probably most proud of to to run with michael for such a long time um when it was basically we didn't run together at all you know for me to run sort of my race my laps my pace um and michael's obviously ran much quicker than i do um so yeah i, I think that was really for me very pleasing to to stick in there for such a long time um 21 hours us as a duo to um to do it for my for you know obviously better than i did in loxton so that was certainly a focus coming from loxton to if i get in that position again don't expect the other person to help you now it's just a you know one-on-one -on -one battle and um yeah I, I think that was sort of the takeaway from that and i wanted to get better at that and <laughs> i certainly um improved on that and i was really happy with you know the way it went on the weekend yeah, sure. Um, and with hysterical carnage, like as you mentioned, Margie was the last one standing. She got the silver ticket, and, and I mean, she's an awesome runner and and a worthy member of the Australian team. But after the dust had settled, did, did you look back at that result and have a feeling that it might have been the one that got away? Um, well, not. I don't think so. I think you know, as you said, Margie finished so well. You know, she didn't even know I cut in short, you know, into the campground in Loxton. Um, but she came in like at 46 minutes, looked fresh, ran like over the line and, and then she only saw me. So, you know, looking back at that, I, I maybe could have pushed her for a few more laps, but I think the space she was in and, you know, obviously she's an elite runner. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I would just have postponed, postponed it for a little bit. Um, but yeah, Mog is, you know, an amazing runner. And uh, looking back, I'm actually glad she's the one um, that got the silver ticket. She's on the team um, because she obviously had close to Cozzy 10 days later. So I think she just wanted to get the race done. Um, and she had such an amazing performance there as well. Mm. And, um, you know, she was she was truly the strongest on, on in that uh, in that event. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the Australian team. You've made it no secret that you'd love to make it on the Australian team. H how long ago did you make that a goal of yours? I think it's always been my goal. I think you know when Aaron has asked me, Phil has asked me, you know, why don't you go the other route to to the South African team and and make it there? My answer is always, I want to push my limits to the most. You know, then you. If I run with the Australian team, I run with the best, you know, there's some of the best in the world. And there shouldn't be any excuses for me to reach my limit. You know, it, it's certainly not where, you know, Phil's at, um, Ryan, Aaron, and a couple of the others. But I think, you know, if, if I do get the opportunity and, and, you know, things go my way in the run, hopefully I can push, you know, a bit further. Um, where with the South African team, I, I don't know, you know, I might win it you just never know but that gets me to bigs but and then there's your opportunity to to sort of push to your limit but i just think for now i want to 
run with the best team possible and um you know try and help australia to be in that number one or two in the world um if possible so that's sort of been my goal and those guys have been a huge help to me you know all of them um have been so great in sharing experiences um sharing knowledge on you know ultra running backyard ultras and um i've certainly learned a lot from them and uh you know they, they've certainly helped me with different things along the way and you know on the weekend i had aaron crew for me i had Gemma crew for me i had brad and i had margie crew for me so you know i couldn't ask for for a better team on ground um you know monica and the kids couldn't couldn't come over so you know those those four stepped in and i certainly had you know the a crew on ground in, at the hoodies yeah it's pretty much the dream team really. <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's a it's a massive you know great team i was really really to, to run sort of for them um you know I, there was a big wobble at, at hour 21 i almost called it um and it, it just you know I, I just heard something and i thought oh i don't want to do that again the second night's gonna be hotter than the first night and that gave me a bit of a wobble and um i think i made that lap with like 55 and a half minutes and with the hoodies course as it is is obviously that 200 meter gap so i thought oh you know i don't really want to go out there anymore but you know <laughs> Gemma was uh, very firm and she said nope you're not done yet get out there for another one aaron margie and brad had my stuff ready and uh said nope you're gonna go out again um and that was sort of my biggest wobble and to add 31 hours to that um I, I was i was obviously very happy with that yeah um so i understand like it, it was a kind of a late notice kind of decision to run at hurdies but maybe about two weeks um, before the race you made a decision so how did you come about making the decision to run at hurdies yeah i think leading up to it i was i was preparing for a for a hundred uh, mile fkt actually across kangaroo island um and two of the of my friends who ran in this in at hurdies have got the current fkt um so that's always sort of been on on the radar that i, I want to you know have a go at that but then dk um david stevens um he pulled up with with the bad hip after tarawera and um you know i quickly moved, shifted my plans around i thought you know i'm i'm in pretty good condition i want to compete i think that was the main thing better it's yes. just i wanted to compete that uh, i didn't just want to go another you know eight or nine week training block to till no time to die so i thought let me go over there it might actually take the pressure off me a little bit um you know see where i'm at I've, I've basically prepared up to 100 miler um i thought my training was pretty good through dubai when i when i was away early earlier in the year um so yeah that, that's sort of how it came about i uh i i was lucky i had some accommodation with with a mate um i had a flight and then uh, i had a previous entry where austin had COVID probably two or three years ago in the week of the race and, and we couldn't travel over to perth so it all just lined up and i thought you know i better take the opportunity see where i'm at and uh you know thankfully i did yeah um i, I noticed on strava when you're in dubai you had it you did um it looks like you really went for a lot of long runs and i can imagine it would have been pretty warm over there as well Luckily, it wasn't too warm. Um, you know, it's sort of winter at the moment, so it was probably the ideal conditions. Is anything from say sixteen to twenty-seven degrees. Um, but I had to improvise a little bit with those long runs because of all the highways. I couldn't always get to certain parts. Um, so what I did a few times was I would two or three times I took a taxi or the train all the way out to Birch Other Up, and then I would run my way back to the hotel, and and that was my longest run. I think that was close to 30 k's um so i did that a few times i had a few nice speed sessions around the dubai frame and um, actually did the birch to birch half marathon when i was there it was about two weeks um into my my trip there and uh, i had a great run I, you know i was just i was pr probably a little bit lucky I, a guy came past me and he seemed to just run you know at a good pace and very consistent i thought let me stick to it with him for a while and I probably ran 19 kilometers with him and and you know probably ran oh i think it would be my best time and it is my best time and i'm not sure if i'll ever beat that yeah. it was just like the perfect morning the perfect sort of pace setter and just stuck with him for as long as i could 
and uh, you know had a really good run. So things in Dubai worked out well. Came back, and I probably had three weeks of training, and you know we got to sort of making the decision on who it is. Yeah, um, and like one of the best things, one of the things I love about backyard ultras so much, and I'm pretty sure you would be the same, is about how social they are. And I know you've made a lot of friends doing the races, and you can't, you've said like you had no problem finding people over in WA to crew for you because you know so many people in the backyard ultra scene already. Yeah, yeah, it's a great scene. I think. Um, you know, for for those guys to to help me out first of all, you know, I, I would think you know Gemma's got the the, the weekend, or she would take it. But uh, you know, she was there from I think Friday evening, and she was right through till the end, till Sunday evening, till we finished. So you know, she definitely stepped in. Margie still had her training runs on, so she did her training um, and came sort of a little bit late on Saturday, which was great. Just a, a fresh face, someone new, um, Aaron unbelievable the whole weekend you know he was there from start to finish with me uh brad did his run and then jumped in once he had had a rest um so yeah they they all you know helped me out um and hopefully i can do the same you know if they, if they ever come this way i i know aaron's coming for irrational south early may and you know i've, I've already offered to to help them out um, as much as i can it's obviously in the flinders um crew for him um be a pacer if i can at, at some point um so I, th I think you know obviously those guys don't do it to get help from me but i just feel i want to pay them back for you know spending the weekend with me helping me pushing me out there patching me up when, <laughs> when i needed to um so yeah yeah I, i've met some some great people um in my my backyard journey so far and as a start, as I touched on at the start, they're all so, so encouraging, so you know, helpful um, with their time, with their knowledge, just with their experiences. You know, to to learn from Tim, Aaron, Phil, with their big journey, mm -hmm. um, even that is is massive. You know, how far they've pushed, um, what they've done on on you know the backyard scene. I can only strive to to hopefully get closer to them, and 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 I think that's what I want to do. You know hopefully surround myself with some of the top runners, not just the top runners, but some of them and uh, keep striving to, to, you know, hopefully close the gap on them. Yeah. Yeah, sure. The, um, because um, they were crewing for you for like the first time, I guess you could say, did you have to provide them with a bit of a race plan or did you, did you show them or did you have anything written out for them to follow as well? Yeah, I had a pretty detailed race plan I thought set out for them <laughs> but uh, after a while Aaron and, and Gemma said where's your food you don't you don't eat nearly enough so I think they tweaked that a little bit but most of the rest was on there you know they they saw what I needed to or, or at least what I needed to drink I think that was that was the main one you know between tailwind and precision um and you know how much water and how much liquids I wanted to take I think that was pretty clear um, when I wanted to sort of think about changing clothes or shoes um, and brush my teeth and sort of freshen up a little bit, I think that side of it helped. But, you know, both of them weren't too impressed with the amount of food I had on there. And, you know, Gemma and, and Aaron, they found me some food. They gave me some food and they kept, you know, keep uh, kept restocking. And uh, every now and then they would, Aaron would push a gel in my hand and said, make sure you take this on the loop. So it was great. You know, they, they kept it going. And for me, in these events, I've never fallen asleep. I've not slept one minute. So even through that, I didn't sleep. But I felt every time I ate something, it like almost became a bit clearer again. Like I could refocus. I could see, you know, the shadows in the, in the dark on the ground. Um, so that was definitely a lesson for me. You know, once you feel a little bit, um, out on your feet is to, you know, try and get something into you. Um, and then that certainly gave me some confidence, you know, going into the future, if, if I'm in that position again, just make sure that I eat something. And um, that sort of got my mind a little bit clearer. You know, in this in this uh, race, I probably laid down eight times for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it wasn't any sleep, but, you know, listening to Harvey, listening to Phil, at least it's something. Uh, man, it's a beginning for me, you know, and in the past, I would sit up the whole of night one, chat to the crew, not rest. And then when you get to night two, you're so tired, um, then it's probably too late. So, you know, that's something I made a point of to try and at least lie down 
and um you know try and rest a little bit i suppose yeah and so would you say that at herdies you you probably ate more or consumed more calories than any other rates maybe a little bit more um i think in the past especially at locks and i was pretty good with it yeah i i ate quite a lot um but maybe just more consistent where they are probably added more spaced out and they would they weren't very happy with the spaced out they said you got to you know more consistent more consistent so that was definitely a lesson i would definitely go back to my plan and and try and fill in more more little things in there um and yeah i i think what i learned from harvey at uh, dead cow gully was to take some food with me on the loops so for quite a few laps in the daytime when it was so hot i would have a packet of grapes in my pocket and after my first seven minute run i would start eating on those um and that, and that was great and as i said aaron you know every probably four or five hours would give me a gel and said just make sure you have this or some of those sports shoes um you know just keep it with you don't have to eat it straight away but maybe in the back straight when you're on the walking break just you know start taking something in and as i said I, th I think it really kept my mind sort of going for for longer um where if i think if i dropped away with my food and no sleep um it might have come crashing down a little bit earlier <laughs> yeah um so when people are struggling mentally to keep going between loops johan most of the time their crew will know what to say to get them back out for another loop so did you give any instructions to Aaron and Brad and Gemma about the type of things that work for you? No, not really. I think um, Aaron just came up to me. It might have been like 15, 16 hours in. And he just asked me, why are you doing this? You know, what are you doing it for? And I said, yeah, I want to run with you guys um, later in the year in October in that satellite champs team. And, and he said, okay, that's it. And, and that's all he went on. And I think when it got difficult later, he just reminded me of that. Yeah. Where with Gemma, we didn't ch chat about that. She just um, said to me at that 21 hour mark, you're not done yet. You're still looking fresh. You're still moving well. Um, you know, give another lap a go and then another one and see where we're at. You know, if, if you're still feeling in, this, in the same spot, you know, then we can chat again. But, you know, sort of clicked out of it. I think it was just like a little bit of a, ma a mental down because I thought, you know, Friday night was really hot. Yeah. And someone said Saturday night's going to be even more humid than hot. And, and I think that just got me down. I thought, I don't know if I can do that again. Um, and, you know, looking back again, I worried about something that, that didn't really come about because it wasn't as hot or I didn't feel as hot on Saturday night. Um, so yeah, you sort of get ahead of yourself way too far. Um, and it was unnecessary really because like i said it, it probably was slightly cooler or at least the breeze made it a bit cooler for me um so yeah that that's pretty much how simple we kept it we didn't you know i didn't say to them you know play me david goggins or you know find me this quote or that quote it, it was pretty simple it was just why are you doing it and then Gemma, in her own way just said nope you're not done yet margie was super positive all weekend and brad with all his energy um you know those two were just they were sort of the the mental specialist they were just positive margie just kept talking to me and said yep you're looking great um keep going uh you you did that lap easy you you know you got another one easily in you and and that would have gone for 15 hours i reckon where she just kept you know reaffirming you're doing well you can do another one <laughs> and we just kept ticking that over and before you knew it you know we were going into the high 40s and then sort of touching 50 yeah the so this this hiccup at around the 21 hour mark was it just a, a pure mental kind of thing there was no you weren't feeling any injuries or anything like that no purely mental i thought you know like i said i, I tried to explain it to you just now it was i just thought i can't do it again i can't do the heat again it was hot um obviously there's going to be less people around the runners are starting to drop out so how am i going to get through another night basically on my own in the dark and it's hot um so yeah it was just like a, a bit of a mental meltdown um you know like i said i, I got to probably over 55 minutes i thought oh i'm slowing down now i'm going to keep slowing down and you know in the two or three laps time i'm going to be done but right back after that i was back to sort of 48 49 minutes and i would have stayed there probably for the next 
25 laps around that that 48 49 minute mark so you know it, it was just a little mental lapse which happens you know you can easily find something i've found that before in in, in other events where you think no i don't want to do this anymore and you know before you know it you don't start a lap or you just ring the bell but um i think that's something too that i've, I've made a point of in the last two or three is not to ring the bell at the start of a lap so um, I think it was pretty funny on the weekend. The one I actually finished on, I was in the back straight, furthest from from the um, from the start finish. And uh, one of the families that supported us all weekend, the lady came over, and the first thing I asked her, is there a shortcut for me to get back? <laughs> and um, you know, for the people out there, it's a lake, so yeah. I would have had to get the flippers on and swim across. But uh, <laughs> you know, she she just smiled and said, "No, no, I'll, I'll take you back." So I was happy that that she looked after me. Yeah. Um, and for people who don't who aren't familiar with the Herdies course, how would you actually describe the Herdies course? It's a really good course. You know, it's it's flat comparing to, you know, comparing it to Loxton. Um but heat is is a big factor. You know, there, there's a lot of heat. Obviously it's uh limestone and bitumen, so the heat comes off, off the ground as well. I think in the end that's the one thing that that got him is my feet my feet were sort of done um so i, I think if you want to do hurdies just know that it's going to be hot um and prepare for that and i think you know foot care is important you know aaron and Gemma really took care of my feet for such a long time you know they would check in every five laps uh, maybe not take the socks and shoes off completely every five laps but i would say at least seven to eight laps there was you know repatching if i need it um they they would you know fresh socks i think something that really helped and felt good was like an ice foot bath Aye. um and they just thought about it you know next time we wash your feet we're going to put ice blocks in the water and that just felt great i just wanted to sit like that for two or three minutes just cool down you know like from your feet and um it almost just refreshed me and, and that was great um you know that felt good and in saying that i think a thing in the past was how panic you feel when when you hear that five minute song or that or three minute buzz and i remember there were four minutes left for the one lap and i still had no socks or no shoes on and you know to get toe socks on is not that quick and yeah, easy yeah. um but yeah Gemma and aaron and, and margie and brad they just said don't worry you've got plenty of time take your time i put my own socks on they just slipped my shoes on i would tie it up and you know there was no panic where in the past i would probably panic a little bit and say come on we've got to hurry up and then you stand in the corral probably for 90 seconds where this time i sort of just strolled up it was 35 40 seconds to go and i was just ready to go so and i think their calmness all weekend really helped yeah. um in certain little situations where you know i could probably panic myself and and think come on we got to rush or we got to get through it but you know they were calm and um just made sure that we we got up by the two minute mark and and got closer because I was probably halfway from the from the finish to the start, and mm. um, so I would say I would probably be in the middle, which was about seventy five meters, hundred meters from from the start line, um, and they just made sure with two minutes to go that I got up and, and sort of slowly started moving, and you know someone would bring my bottles and someone if I had to take some some food with me, someone would have it. Um, yeah, so so the whole crew sort of moved with me to the start of the corral and then handed over and away I went. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I know at the Masters, um, you spent a lot of time running with Tim Kaprizak and Aaron Young, running together, like run-walk strategy. Um, and the same at Hysterical Carnage, you spent a lot of time running with DK Stevens and I think a couple of his friends too. Um, did you form a team at any stages and run with other people at Herdies? no i didn't actually i didn't have sort of anyone jump jumping on my strategy yeah <laughs> i don't know if I, I was too slow or you know actually i did there was there was a, a young guy um dane who's 13 years old super little runner and um, even he ran away from me at the start um and then myself and um chris martin sort of said to him you got to slow down a bit if you want to go longer so you know i slowed dane down probably for three or four laps um, before he rolled his ankle on the on the ninth loop, and uh, unfortunately, he had to pull out on on the next yard. Um, but that that was pretty much my company. Chris would come past every now and then, or we'd just sort of, you know, find each other at, at different points along the loop. But 
I hardly ran with with anyone for a full loop. Um, it was just, you know, that's just how it was. Obviously, at the start, there's a lot of runners, so there's people around you, but I didn't really find someone to sort of talk to a lot or, or things like that. Um, and I think in a way, it might have helped later in the race when I was all on my own for for such a long period. I'd already done it up until then, and I know my strategy is, is pretty good, you know, getting that from, from Aaron, Jess, and Tim mm -hmm. um, over the years. And I thought, let me just continue with it. And I started with it at lap one. You know, in, in the past, I would sort of think, oh, I'll run till I'm tired, and then I'll click over to the strategy where, you know, these days it's pretty much straight on to it. Um, it helps me break down the lap a little bit. And um, it certainly helped me as the event went on. When, I, when it got quiet, there was no one around. It was just myself and Michael. I think, you know, if I didn't have that, I would have panicked and it certainly wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. Yeah. Now, as far as that strategy goes, I'm pretty sure you've told me you like to start off running for seven minutes, then you'll walk for two, and then you'll go uh, run for three and then walk for two. Is that right? Is that how you do it? Yeah, seven minutes and then three minute walk to get to 10. So they get on the even number. And I tweaked it a little bit on the weekend um, in the heat, in the daytime. I actually only ran for two minutes and walked for three. So I didn't want to overrun and, and, you know, get the heart rate up and keep it up for too long. So when I ran, I tried to run with a bit of purpose. So I ran you know, not quick, but at a decent speed. And then I would walk for three minutes. And I found that was still more than enough the saturday and the sunday um, but once it clicked into the night time i would i would um run for three minutes walk for two but it, it sort of still worked out to a similar time you know it, it wasn't much much difference i probably ran a little bit slower at night yeah. um i didn't have to you know overrun or run too fast when the daytime i felt i wanted to make a point of it yeah you know, when, when it was time to run to run with a bit of purpose and and to walk, you know, still with a bit of purpose and try to keep the heart rate as, as low as I could. Um, but the, the night time was back to normal, you know, and it, then it obviously keeps it, takes you to 15 minutes with the three and two, then three and two again takes you to 20. So it's just easy, you know, on the mind too, when you have to sort of try and keep track of it. Because um, as I said, this one was all on me. So I had to keep track of the watch. Yeah. Um, when in the past, when I run with Tim and Aaron and, and different and DK, and they would sort of take charge of the watch for a few laps and, and I would sort of just switch off for a bit and just follow along mm -hmm. where this one was, you know, all on me and uh, I had to keep an, an eye on the watch all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I noticed a lot of runners dropped out after the 24-hour mark and by the time Yard 32 came along, um, it was just you and Bellman. So did the two of you like get together and kind of talk about what each of you wanted out of the race? Yep, yep, we did. Um, yeah, the, that 24 hour mark, I think it's just one of those, maybe two or three or, or four people, you know, really struggled to get there and, and they thought that was my limit and that's where I was going to stop. And probably for most of them, it's setting a target and getting there and thinking, okay, my race is done. And um, so that's why I think the 24 hour mark is, is such a, a big one for people to stop. And maybe the next one would be 30 hours because that's 200 Ks. Um, but yeah, I think lap 31, I sort of jogged up to Michael at the start, you know, because he was quick throughout. And I said to him, you know, you're the best runner here. Um, you know, what do you want out of it? And he said, yeah, I just want to get as many laps as I can. And we sort of said, yeah, let's work together for a bit. But once the other guy dropped, at the end of 31 and we got to 32 he said to me well i'm gonna go quick now because i need to go sleep so 32 and 33 was quick and and that was sort of the last time we really chatted um from then on it was basically each one to, to his own um and you know fair enough you know, michael was there to to do a job he wanted to win it um he wanted to prove that last year wasn't you know a lucky shot um and he certainly did that this weekend he was so consistent i remember the last lap he still ran in on 47 minutes um it looks so good um and yeah like i said at the start i was just happy to sort of go into my race and think okay i've got to at least get to four laps because in loxton i only did three of these on my own okay and let's go to five now let's go to six and and that's sort of you know how it panned out for me i just wanted to do another one and another one and 
and try and extend sort of that patch for me. I mean, I think, you know, that should hopefully help me in the future if I ever get into that sort of battle again. Can I hang in there hopefully this time or next time for long enough to, you know, maybe be the last one standing? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we know that Bellman's like an awesome runner and you obviously would have known that probably before the race as well. Um, and you knew he wasn't going to drop anytime soon. So I can imagine that when you were thinking that that you were probably in exactly the perfect situation at that 32-hour mark, you knew Bellman wasn't going to stop and you were in the perfect situation to make the at-large list, which was your ultimate goal at the end of the day. True, true. So, you know, refocus to that. Um, you know, that's ultimately why, why I went through this week and I thought, you know, Michael will be there. They might be in such a big field, 367. We might have, who knows, four or five going into the 40s, late 40s. Um, and that might drag me to sort of that, that 50, 51, 52 hour mark. Um, but once that didn't happen, my mind was still set on, I've got a, this might be my only and my best chance to get onto that at large list. Um, there's no guarantees at no time to die. Um, I've got to travel again, sort of June, July. And for me personally, I feel, you know, birdies and uh, Clint is just too close to the sat champs. Uh, I can't leave it that late. You know, I, I, I'm going to be on the road probably for six weeks in the US. Um, so I wanted to do it now. And if it didn't happen last week and in Perth, I gave myself a second chance, maybe with no time to die. So that that's the way I took it. I, you know, I thought I'm feeling good. I don't have any sort of, you know, niggles or issues. My feet just got sore and it stayed sore and it just got worse as it went on. But I thought that, you know, normally I struggle with cramps um, in the heat. And I thought, okay, there's no cramps yet. There's no cramps yet. Let's keep going for another one. And I sort of just kept going with that. And, you know, by the end, um, I was happy to go into that low 50s. Um, and, yeah, you know, pretty happy with, with the end result. Yeah, definitely. Um, and leading into the race, you would have known what number you would need to run to make the at-large list. You would have had to have um, beat 49 to make the at-large list. So were you all about beating 49 yards or did you just want to – or did you have a total in mind that was way beyond that or did you just want to just go until you just couldn't go any longer? I think – you know, I think my first, and, and it's been my main goal for a long time, was to get to 48 hours to try and break 200 miles for the first time ever. And, you know, when you've never done that, it, it feels a long way away, especially when you start. You know, those first few laps, you think, wow, 48, that's a long way. And to, and to the elite guys, they talk about sort of that's the fun run. That's just when they've warmed up. And I always said, okay, gee, for me, that's definitely not a fun run. So this weekend, I think it was – it was, you know, ticking that one off. And then after that, it was just, okay, can I do 49? And then the next one was, can I do 50? 50 sounds a lot better than 49. Um, and then I wanted to sort of prove, okay, I wasn't lucky to get to 50. Can I get to 51? And then it was 52. Um, and, yeah, Margie was sort of the one kept reminding me, you know, every, every yard you do, you're going up that list. And she was sort of the one um, pushing that. So, you know, I think in the end, it was pretty much pushing till I couldn't go anymore. So I, I would have got to half one in the lap, probably at 35, 36 minutes. And I thought, I'm not going to run quicker now than I, than I have been, you know, up until that point. And the last little bit it hurt is, is like three little trail sections. You drop down from the path onto trail, you come back and you do it three times. And the previous lap, I almost tripped on, you know, just a, a route. And I thought, ah, my vision is not great at the moment. So I changed the headlights to a much stronger headlight. Um, but even that, I thought, yeah, I, I don't really want to do that again, um, trip and fall over and hurt myself. And, yeah, my feet were just, you know, not in a great space anymore. And, and you know, that's certainly something to take away from this weekend. I, I still want to continue to improve on foot care and, and if I can get, more rest that, that would be great and i think if i can tick those two off i certainly feel like i can push a bit further yeah definitely um so when i was actually thinking and you might have seen i posted it on instagram um that when it was down to just you and bellman i was actually thinking it was a, a bit like a last wicket stand in a test match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we sort of hung around for a long time <laughs> yeah. yeah we just uh, kept irritating our position we 
got a couple of, I got a couple of lucky inside edges, went past <laughs> the stumps or a couple of plain misses. Um, but yeah, it's it sort of like I, I try to explain it. It just seemed to just go one after the other. You seem to just get into the zone where you think, okay, I've got to my previous PB, which was 43. Okay, can I do 44 now? And then you think, okay, 45 300 Ks. That's another nice little milestone. Okay, I've done 45. Um, 48 is re it's right there. It's in touch touching distance. I don't want to be the Kev Matthews story where I think I'm going to stop at 47. Shame. Yeah. Kev was there this weekend. I heard it a few times where he told guys around me about his 47, yeah. 47 yards. So, you know, it's just these little things along the way that sort of kept me ticking over. Um, it's probably like getting through an over. You know, can I get through this over? And then you get through the next one. And before you know it, the opposition sort of gets under a bit of pressure because the game's getting to an end. And, you know, who knows what Michael was feeling like? He might, you know, outwardly have, have looked great. Who knows? If I could have hung in there for two, maybe three more laps, it might have been a different story. But, you know, at that moment, he was still looking super strong. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the 40, that or yard number 43. And there was one moment on the live stream around that mark where you dropped your drink bottle and Gemma was about to, she nearly picked it up, but you turned around and picked it up <laughs> you, you know what it was, Pat? What, what, yeah, what was it? It was my phone. Oh, well, <laughs> right. I, dropped my, I dropped my phone next to her and I said, Gemma, please take this back. Because oh. at that stage, I didn't have my headphones in. And I thought, I'm just going to carry my phone around the loop for nothing. Yeah. Um, so I dropped it next to Gemma and I said, Gemma, can you please take this back? And then, wow, Phil... Sean, the rest all started screaming in it. So I felt bad. Monica told me afterwards, you know, Gemma must have felt so bad because she almost, you know, disqualified you. And yeah, it was, it was a close call. It's sort of something that just creeps up on you. You think, oh, it's okay. I can just drop it or I can leave something. But, you know, that's probably where your mind starts going. You don't think as clearly. Um, so, yeah, the race could have ended a whole lot earlier. Um, but yeah, luckily Gemma didn't touch my phone. I just turned around, came back, picked it up and put it sort of in my, in my race belt at the back. Um, and yeah, she, you know, she, she, she joked about it for the rest of the rest of the trip. Please don't throw me anything. I'm going to stand far away from the barriers. I don't want to see you run past me. <laughs> so yeah, we joked about it a couple of times. Um, but yeah, even, you know, for Phil and Sean to be switched on because obviously the live feed would certainly give it away and someone would pick it up and make a you know comment on that um so they were you know aware of it um switched on with the situation and said no no don't touch it um and i heard that so i just turned around picked it up and and you know continued yeah um using the a cricket analogy you almost ran this <laughs> out yes yes that would have been <laughs> disaster in, in getting into that uh that situation and then uh you know just panicking doing the wrong thing at the wrong time yeah and uh setting off and getting run out <laughs> <laughs> so um so if you compare how you were feeling at hurdies on loop 43 to how you were feeling when you ran your 43rd loop at the masters was there a big difference um i think physically not too big a difference. I, I think that's where sort of Tim's words always come to mind with me. He says, you're going to get to a point probably in the mid 40s where everything hurts, but it's going to stay pretty level from there on. Mm. And I think that was sort of my mind. Can I get myself sort of to that stage for the first time in my backyard ultra career, you know, where it hurts, but it doesn't get any worse. And I think, you know, maybe another two laps, it sort of stayed similar. And then I felt like, you know, it almost got easier again. Um, and then like, you know, early 50s, my, my feet really started feeling it. But I felt there for a patch, probably from 45 to 50, where I felt, gee, I'm feeling great. I'm moving well. I'm getting in around the 48-minute mark. Um, so I was really pleased with that to, to sort of touch that for the first time. You know, as Tim has explained to me so many times, you've yeah. got to get through that. You've got to break through that. And I thought, okay, Tim, I'm going to try um so i was really happy to to get to that stage where um i felt it almost stated at one level for a while um so yeah that that was certainly a big breakthrough for me and mentally and i thought tim that can't be true you know it's got to get worse and it's going to stay worse and you just got to 
you know, crash and burn eventually. But, you know, it, it, it pretty much was like that. I reckon from 44 to 50, I felt pretty much the same every lap. Um, you know, the crew, they kept, kept me stocked up. I had enough drinks. I probably had 800 mils to a litre every lap um, just in the heat. And I would have had a, a snack or something with me every lap. Yeah. The, I mean, watching the live stream, you looked really good. Like, I was surprised when you dropped out, but now I know it was your feet. Like, what was the, what were you, did you have blisters or was it just, were they just hurting or like what? Do you know what? It, yeah, what? I, I, had, I had quite a few blisters in the end, but, um, you know, they got patched up along the way. But funny enough, like at the bottom of my heel, like on the, you know, as you put your foot down, there were probably two blisters on each side. And, and that was unusual. I've never had that. And I, and I think that was from walking. You know, it's obviously a different foot strike because usually I land like midfoot and there's no issues like that. But on such a hard surface with all the heel striking walking, um, you know, that just created those hot spots at the bottom of my heels. Um, my second time on the right foot was, you know, really starting to, to, to feel it. Um, so I let some of the pressure out there, you know, lifted the nail or opened the nail up for you know some of the the liquid to come out um, to release some of the pressure so that helped for for a little while probably for two or three laps but i think eventually i just didn't want to run on that hard surface anymore um and that's certainly you know people say but oh come on surely you can push through that and you can go for a bit longer but you know at dead cow gully with only half the laps on such a hard surface i think already at 43 laps there i also called it because of my feet because my feet were so sore and that was only half the lap so i was really pleased with you know going 50 plus laps on such a hard surface you know twice times 12 hours in the heat when it's you know the heat comes up from the bottom um you know maybe something that i thought about in this week the the sort of asic super blast shoes that i took only had 50 k's each on them so they were pretty firm and i think you know, I probably should have should have given a little bit more attention to that going into it. Maybe got them to like 150, 200 k, so they could soften up a little bit. And then the New Balance Moors were probably too far the other way. They were really soft. So after a while, it feels like you know those rocks and stones on the ground. You pretty much just feel them. And I explained to someone today, it's like thinking I'm going to take a big fat saddle when I go for a bike ride, and that should be the best one. But after a few k's, you pretty much sit through the, the padding and you sit on the plastic. So you, you might as well sit on a, on a firm seat. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what it sort of felt like, um, if I can explain it. So, you know, maybe a little bit to go back to there, you know, my, my sort of shoe choice. Um, maybe give them a little bit more of a run in so they're not as firm to start with. And then the older pair was probably a little bit, you know, on the other side over there. The um, you know how it is with backyard ultras. Looking back, often people regret dropping when they did. So, um, how are you about it now? You you happy? I mean, fifty two is an awesome result. So, how are you feeling about dropping when you did right now? Yeah, you know, you always think, can could I have done one more? You know, could I have completed that one? But you know, chatting to to Monica, especially in in the last two or three was to go till I feel like I can't go anymore. And I felt I pretty much, I got as far as I could this weekend. Um, you know, I, I didn't stop, you know, on the start line. I didn't stop right there and then turn around and walk to the bell and ring it. I, I did probably another 3.1 Ks. So I, I went around um, as far as, not as far as I could, but as far as I felt, I sort of look at my average pace and that was starting to go sort of, 9.45, 9.50, 10 minutes a K. And I thought, gee, I've got to have to run quite a bit quicker here to make it. And that's sort of when I called it. Um, so I, I think I, I certainly left it all out there. You know, to come from that wobble at 21 hours and to add another 31 onto that was, you know, I was really happy with that. And to run pretty much for 20 hour, 21 hours alone, um, I was certainly proud of that this weekend to to hang in there for such a long time, especially coming from a circle where I said to you with, with Margie, she she just finished me off. She said, "Ah, oh, you know, I've, that's enough of him now. I'm gonna do quick two quick laps and see where he's at." And you know that that was enough on that on that occasion. Um, yeah, I was happy to sort of fall back, just get back in my bubble, um, back into my strategy, and and do that for as long as I could. 
Yeah. Um, so the 52 yards places you eighth on the at-large list. And there are a few more races to go in the qualifying period, like um, Dead Cow Gully, Wild Dog, No Time to Die, Birdies and Clint Eastwood, like you said. They're the races probably expected to reach high totals. So how safe do you feel sitting on 52 yards? Yeah, I didn't feel safe at all. <laughs> you know, a few people have said, oh, you'll be safe, you'll be safe. 52 is more than enough. But, you know, as a sort of a sportsman, you just never trust that. Till it's mid-August and you get the final call or email to say you've done it, you know, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of rest on that f at all for now. Um, you know, I'm sort of in my back of my mind thinking, can we get a bit of a group to, together at no time to die? And should I try and add to that? If I feel good enough and I've recovered well enough over the next two or three weeks and I start building up again, you know, I know Dan Kamak will be there. Uh, DK will be there. You know, is there a couple of others that we don't know of that, you know, could push that far? Could we could we add to that? Um, so you know that's certainly the way I'm, I'm thinking about it at the moment. Um, if I get into that situation again, and you know there's two or three around, can we move ourselves up that list? Um, but yeah, for the moment, I'm certainly don't think I'm safe. You know, if, if someone might say that and think that, um, I certainly don't. The um, Dan Carmack, you broke you broke his um, South Australian record too at Hurdies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a nice one to tick off, but it's it's sort of nice to maybe get the acknowledgement for a little bit. But, you know, I've run a lot with Dan, you know, I've, I know him pretty well. Um, he came and supported me when I ran my, my 40 yards for my 40th birthday. He did quite a lot of those with me. Um, so we always chat about backyards. Um, you know, I chatted to him before Miriam Wernett, um, and he was in a really good space um so yeah it, you know it's going to be broken again yeah. you know if, if it's not him it's going to be someone else so i think just to have it for a little bit is is nice um but yeah you know he, he's obviously a great runner he's still young it's you know how much he really wants to do in backyard ultras he's so quick in the other stuff you know he's got the ice and fkt so he can run fast he can run far i think if he gets in the right situation with the right guys you know, if, if he stays on that list at that number 10 mark for now, I think he could go very far at that satellite champs, you know, with the right bunch of guys or the right group, you know, with Margie included and maybe a couple of other ladies. You just never know. I think he could, on the right day, um, with the right nutrition plan and, and, you know, the right strategy, I think he can go, you know, probably into the 60s. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like um, that race at Miram Wernet when he was the assist, that was a, such a tough race. That not only was it really hot, the course was just incredibly hard. So that run to do thirty four yards was a, an amazing, amazing um, result for him. And I think he will. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys do smash it at No Time to Die. Uh, have you locked it in yet, or are you still thinking about it? No, I'll lock it in. I haven't, you know, officially signed up. But Austin, my my thirteen year old, won the golden ticket, so he's got a race entry into all the ultra series events for the year. So he's locked in. We're currently sort of training together for that. Um, he had a great run at at, um, at Loxton. Um, you know, really proud of ten laps for him. Um, so yeah, he he was super keen to to go again. So you know, obviously, no time to die is very easy for us. It's in the city. It's probably 15 minutes from home. Um, so he's locked in, so I'll I'll have to get locked in too. <laughs> so I think I'll help him out for as much as I can or as much as he can go for and then sort of click over into my own sort of race and, and see, you know, where we're at, what conditions are like, who's mm -hmm. remaining, and then, you know, hopefully my body holds up pretty good again and, and mentally good. And, you know, hopefully, we like you said, we can do something special and, and you know, push that... Uh, into the 50s if we can if we're good enough um and hopefully move ourselves up to that list or up that list and and hopefully secure our spot for for october because i think that's going to be huge you know that's um something that you know i would definitely want to be part of um it's a great group of runners it's obviously um guys who are at the, the peak of their game and uh, i certainly want to 
not so much test myself against them, but that's a space I reckon where if you if you look after yourself and you're in a good space, you can really push push your PB out there to to something you know something quite big. Yeah, um, and and like you said before, the Australian team is so strong. That 52 yards that you've got, that would probably put you top three in most countries. But Australia is so strong. Um, yeah, I mean that's just goes to show how good the Australian team is. It is a very good team. I think you know with, with uh, where Phil has raised the bar to, and you know the rest of the the crew aspiring to get to that. I think that's just a great position to be in. Um, and I'm certainly one of them. You know, I might be at the low end of, of the guys to get you know more up the list or higher up the the amount of yards. Um, but certainly, you know, watching those guys go about it um, and having done a few of them now to know what it takes and how long it is to to get there um, is certainly something special. And you know, I, I would love to the chance to run with them for for you know as a team first of all. And, um, you know, Margie said to me a few times, not just over the weekend, but, you know, it's a whole completely different race. You know, everyone's helping each other. Um, everyone, you know, wants you to do that extra lap, um, which is obviously different to a race where everyone's sort of in their own bubble. Yeah, we're talking and we're helping each other, but up into a certain point. And when it gets hard, you start thinking, okay, you can drop out now because, you know, I want to be one of the last few and hopefully the last two and hopefully the last one if, if you can. But, you know, I think in that sort of format, in a, in the sat champs, you know, they they certainly going to encourage the other to go as far as possible, and you know, to move from third a couple of years ago, I'm sure, you know, the guys at the top will will strive to to go better and and be number two or number one in the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you played cricket. Well, a lot of people would know you played cricket at the highest level, um, with and against the best players in the world. And you, but you've also run with some of the best backyard ultra runners in the world too. So I know it's hard to compare sports, but <laughs> are the top backyard ultra runners right up there with the best sports people that you, you, you've competed with just as sports people? Oh, yeah, certainly. I think um, I might have thought about this today. You know, backyard runners don't get paid to do that. Yeah. Um, so it's purely, you know, the passion for it, the – you know the drive to get out there every day and, and you know i i think for me it's, it's the consistency you know guys are out there day after day you follow them on strava or you follow them wherever guys just keep doing it um where i think in the cricket field or in cricket in my my um situation i think the your skill covers for a lot so you don't always have to be super fit you know to to be at the top level or at the high end if you can you know, switch on well between balls um, and get your concentration like right on focused for when the ball's in play. I think, you know, then you obviously already become an even better player. And if you can do that ball after ball after ball, then you become one of the really good players. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to compete from a, from a physical point of view. I think, you know, the backyard guys and the ultra runners are, you know, different level. You know, the guys put in hours and hours and, you know, you've obviously got to do a lot of things right. You know, it's hydration, it's nutrition, it's recovery, it, it's so many other things. Well, I think a little bit with cricket, like I said, it, it, your skill covers quite a lot of it. Um, and you've got to be fit, but, you know, I don't think – I'm certainly way fitter now than what I was when I played cricket. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's probably, probably a sign. And, you know, you, there's nowhere to hide in a, in a backyard loop. You know, Kev Matthews always says – you have a bad 15 minutes that's the end of your race where you know i think in cricket the type of game if you have a bad over or two you can always come back from it um or if, you know if the team has a, a couple of bad overs you can someone can sort of change the momentum and, and pull you sort of back on in line but you know with, with this format you certainly can't do that you can't have a, a an hour off and uh, try and bounce back one because then you'll be out the race Mm. Um, one of the things I really get excited about with backyard ultras is that you see people well into their 50s who are still some of the best out there. So um, does that get you excited as well? Like your playing career in cricket, um, 
um, has pretty much, I mean, I think it's finished, but does that get you excited that you've got this new sport that you're really passionate about, that you know that you're going to be able to keep improving for a long time? It definitely does. I think, you know, my running sort of started picking up towards the end of my playing career. Uh, when I was just playing Big Bash, I, you know, only played for basically December and January. So I thought, you know, I've got to find something that's challenging um, and it's going to keep me fit. And that's sort of where the running really started picking up. So the last seven and a bit years, that's where the running has really sort of picked up. And um, I think that the gap that it's filled is that competitive bit, you know, always being a professional sportsman to compete. I think this is certainly where the backyard ultra and, and the ultra running sort of kicks in um, is to help me with that, to, to um, you know, find that, that void, sort of fill that void. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th that's, that's sort of the thing for me um, to, to keep. And, and I always want to keep improving. You know, I want to aim to be the best. I might not be the best. Or I might never get to the top. But, you know, I'm certainly treating it that way, that I want to be consistent. I want to do my best every day. Um, and hopefully set an example for, you know, some other people. You know, I'm obviously looking at the high end as, as sort of the guys that I want to follow. But hopefully I can be, you know, a idol or, or a uh, role model to someone who is now maybe at 15 yards, who, where I was at 20 yards three years ago. And that was sort of my limit. And, you know, slowly but surely you um, you build it up and, and you improve. And, you know, hopefully... You know, that's that's the aim is for for other people also to to aim to get better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're you're on an up, upward trend. I'm a hundred percent sure that your best is still to come. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the aim. You know, that's that's sort of what I, I try and do. Um, you know, you're obviously going to get to a point where you've reached your sort of ceiling and you you'll come down the other side. But hopefully, like you said, that that's still quite a way away. You know, Harvey's. 48, you know, ran, ran um, you know, 720 odd Ks last year. But that's with a, a lot of, you know, experience behind him. So I'm, you know, being pretty new in this, you know, like seven years into it, not even seven. I, I reckon I've only run ultras probably for the last four years. Um, you know, hopefully I can keep getting on that, on that upward graph and uh, at least do that, you know, hopefully through my 40s and then uh, even into my 50s but you know th there's obviously a lot of things that you got to keep your you know your eye on um, nutrition is obviously a big one your recovery I think recovery is a big one I can always get better at that um, but that's certainly something that I think would help from the professional days um, to keep doing that so that's certainly something that I, I try and do pretty good um, but yeah it's, it's always uh, something to, to try and get better at Mm. Um, you mentioned Austin, your son, before, how, about how well he did at Hysterical Carnage. And I think he was 13 at the time and he did the 10 yards, like you said. And Hysterical Carnage, that was a hard course and it was <laughs> hot as well. So it was an imp a really impressive um, performance. And, yeah, I mean, you mentioned he won that golden ticket and he's doing no time to die. Does he have any other um, races planned? Uh, with that golden ticket, we did the ballet half marathon uh, probably mid-March. So that was one of them. And um, we'll do No Time to Die as the next one. Um, then Wild Dogs, I'm not quite sure if, if we'll still be here or if I'll be already over in the US. Um, and then we'll do something in the Ison series, you know, the, the Ison race at the end of the year. There's obviously long ones, 115. I think there's a 70, there's a 50. But I think there's a couple of shorter ones around the 35K mark and maybe 17K mark. So maybe one of those bottom two, we might do that later in the year. So just give him a bit of focus. I know, you know, he's 13. He certainly can't do all the events. You know, he, he nowhere near can do a 100 mile or a 200 mile. Eh? And, and that's obviously, you know, three of the bigger events from the Alta series. And um, so, you know, I think for now, we're just trying to be smart with it, not completely put him off. Um, you know, before Loxton, we did, his longest run was 11 Ks. And then we did a little a simulation one day of we tried to do six yards, but he couldn't make it through six. So we did five. So it moved him to low 30s. And then he obviously doubled that at Loxton. So I think his training at the moment is nothing like Oli Kaprizak, where it's, you know, some serious work that he puts in. I think for Austin at the moment, it's pretty much 
we try and get a little bit of consistency. So I, I reckon his training would be anything from 18 to maybe 25, 30 Ks a week um, on the better weeks. So, you know, I think that's where we're at at the moment. It's, it's not, you know, big days, day in, day out. Um, and then once we get into the race situation, let's see if we can push a bit more there. So that's sort of the way the two of us are taking it at the moment. You know, it, it's not big mileage. Um, at the moment, you know, he's, he's still young. He's big. You know, he's obviously tall and he looks older than 13, but still, you know, he's only got a 13-year-old body. Um, you know, we're not, we don't want to definitely don't want to break it too soon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we're just trying to get a little bit of consistency. I think, you know, that's something I'll, I touch on a lot is, is to try and be consistent. You know, it doesn't have to be massive miles, but can we get out there for four days a week at least? Um, we've got a bit of a, a schedule where... Wednesday morning preschool, we do a backyard lap because his school just starts a little bit later. So that's certainly in there in a week. And then on a Saturday morning, we usually run two park run, do park run and run back. And, you know, that only it gives us about 9K, but that's sort of his, long, his longest run for the week. So that's sort of what it looks like for us at the moment. Um, but, yeah, consistency is left in, definitely the key. You know, it's, it's easy to, you know, get caught up in computers and, and video games and things like that and, before you know it, you know, two weeks have gone by and you've, you've done no training. Um, so, yeah, even when I was in Perth over the weekend, I told him he needs to do at least three three sessions while I'm gone. And, you know, credit to him, he did do them. Um, he did it, you know, it wasn't long, maybe a, a 4K, a 3K, and then a 9K. So, you know, we'll, we'll get back onto the park run train tomorrow and run to park run and, and uh, do park run and run home. So, you know, and, and then next week we'll resume as usual. We get back onto the four four training sessions a week, and I reckon that we've got about seven weeks to no time to die. Yeah, excellent. So, um, so you're doing park run tomorrow. You've obviously pulled up okay. You've re you've recovered all right. Yeah, I feel pretty good. My feet's still still a bit sore. Um, yeah, you know, I'll just run within myself in the morning. I'm not gonna try and beat any records if it takes me you know, 35 minutes, that that's fine. You know, I just I just want to sort of start moving a little bit again. Even if I have to go to a strategy where I run for 500 meters, walk for 500, um, you know, I, I just want to get back out there um, because it's easy with, with these things to, you know, have a, have a main race, have a focus, and then you sort of step away. And before you realize that you've done, you know, 10 days, two weeks of nothing, um so i just i just want to slowly get back out there start walking like tomorrow morning our warm-up might be just a one and a half k walk to park run and then we'll do it and, and austin can he'll probably outrun me tomorrow um because he you know you know he can run a 23 24 minute park run um well i don't think i'll be able to touch that tomorrow so he can do his park run and wait for me at the end and then you know we'll just make our way our way yeah. back home um, but yeah, it, it's again, the consistency to try and be an example to him, you know, when you're done with a big goal and, and you've ticked it off, you know, to sort of keep striving to get better. And, and I think for me, the getting better at the moment is not to get fitter, it's just to get a bit of movement going. And I, and I think that might be even next week and probably into the following week. It, there doesn't have to be anything big. It can be maximum of 40 minutes, um, but the consistency is going to be key just to to start moving again and then maybe have a good April and then almost time to come down again towards uh, no time to die. Yeah. Um, so no time to die is obviously locked in. Um, what other races have you got planned for the year? And not just any race. It doesn't have to be a backyard ultra. Actually, no other race. So it was, it was basically three backyards for me if, if it works out that way. Yep. And the reason I say it works out that way is obviously October for me. Um, so I've, you know, just done hurdies. Um, the ballet marathon with Austin was basically a training run. Um, I stayed with him the, the, the whole half marathon. Um, then no time to die. And then I'll go to the U S for cricket for a bit, June, July. Um, and then see where we're at because then, you know, I come back pretty much early August when birdies is on. Um, and then hopefully in those next two weeks, it will determine, you know, what happens in October? You know, am I going to Perth, or um, you know, if not, you know, someone's done really well and and you know they they deserve that spot. Um, if, if yeah, if I don't do it, then um, you know we'll probably do the Heisen in in some sort of um, distance. Uh, probably be 
as a bit of a challenge for us and might be the 37, which uh, there's a little bit of a climb early and then, you know, a long, slow downhill to Victor Harbour, which mm. is a beautiful run. You know, those last probably 12 Ks, you come over the rise and there's just the ocean in front of you and it's a beautiful run in. So I think, you know, we'll definitely do that and work towards that um, in, in, I think it's early October. Yep, yep, sounds good. Um, so, Johan, you might know that I like to get free backyard ultra tips from my guests at the towards the end of the episodes, and and you've improved so much um, at backyard ultras. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what yours are. Yeah, Pat, I think uh, I've said it a few times tonight. Is it's, number one for me would be consistency. Um, you know, consistency in training. I suppose consistency in everything. Your your loops. Um, how you go about it, your nutrition, um, hydration on the course, um, and even practicing that. I, I thought about that earlier today. It's so easy just to rock up and think, oh, I'm just going to do this now. You know, like especially eating. I think a lot of guys last weekend struggled with that. Like the heat just took their appetite away and they didn't want to eat anymore. So I've certainly practiced that. You know, I would have breakfast before I go for a run. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's certainly one thing I've, I've try to to get better at just staying consistent um number two i would say foot care you know i think that's something that stopped me now probably in the last three events um it's something i want to certainly still get better at you know learning from aaron um he told me about a book fixing your feet which i bought and i've read and i think it's better you know my feet were in a better state for longer this weekend um and then obviously to have Gemma there to sort of look after it and and patch me up certainly helped and showed me you know how it can and should be done um so yeah that, that's something that I'm always always looking to to get better at um and number three yeah I don't know really <laughs> um yeah I, I don't know Pat. I, I, that's uh can't think of anything now. Um, no, that's all right. Well, do you have anything to do with mindset that um, is important to you? Um, I think something that I've really only touched in the last while is sort of breathing. Um, you know, listening to to different sort of breath work and that um, oxygen advantage. Um, listening to that and and digging a little bit deeper into that. I think I tried that a few times on the weekend when sort of the heart rate got a bit up or I got away from from the race a little bit and I got ahead of myself. Maybe in that tough patch, that I might have done a little bit of that, you know, just to come back to breathing and, and you know, sort of refocusing and staying in the moment. Um, I must say that I haven't done a lot of that. Um, I, you know, I've probably been a little guilty in the past to almost just do it the two weeks before an event, do it in the event and then sort of stop with it. Um, where I think... I've probably got the benefits on the weekend. So it's certainly something that I should continue. Um, it certainly helped me on the weekend in a couple of tough patches, um, just to refocus, getting back in the moment when you sort of get ahead of yourself or you start worrying about things that, you know, so far in the future. Um, so, yeah, I would say that that's number three is um, just a bit of breathing, just, you know, even in ice baths, you know, that's something to even get you through that because that's a little bit of a challenge when, you know, the water is around 8 to 10 degrees. Um, it's easy to panic and sort of get a bit uh, rattled with it all. But, um, you know, if you, you can calm yourself down with, with your breathing. So I certainly think that's, that's something I should continue over the next two months um, and then hopefully be even better with that come no time to die. Um, if, we, if we get into the more difficult stages of the race or even just any stage of the race where you feel you know, you, you're getting out of your, your current situation or your current lap. Um, maybe, I, you know, go back to that and, and use that. Mm. I actually read a really interesting article or interview with Ehor Veres, and yep. he was, he was um, talking about how he, um, he focuses a lot on breathing through his nose when he runs. Um, were you, is that what you were doing as well when you were focusing on your breathing? Were you breathing through your nose? Yes. Yes, yeah, so with that oxygen advantage, um, it's all about breathing through your nose. Um, so I, I might struggle a little bit when you know my heart rate goes up to continue just breathing through my nose. But when I walk now, I can 100% just breathe through my nose. And that 
sort of calms everything down. Um, and I think your heart rate sort of drops quicker and it, it stays lower for, for longer. Um, so yeah, that, that's certainly something that I, I pay attention to. Um, I, I think it definitely works. I, I think it even, well, not even, it, it will work when you try and sleep, um, just to, to calm you down, calm you down quicker. Um, you know, maybe that's something I should look into to try and get some more rest is for the first minute. Can I just focus on my breathing and sort of calm everything down? Well, I found in the weekend when I lay down, I was still sort of huffing and puffing a little bit for the first two minutes. And then, you know, in the back of your mind, I've only got three minutes left. It's almost time to go again where, you know, it might not sound like much, but that extra minute of calm rest, you know, could, could be an extra yard later. So that's certainly something to, to keep improving on. Um, you know, I know the best guys can certainly sleep. But uh, I haven't got there yet. Um, that's still something to to keep working on, to keep tweaking, and uh, you know, hopefully, soon it will happen. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was a book called The Breathing Advantage. Is that is that what you said? O Oxygen Advantage. Yeah, yeah, I might have to I might have to put that on my list. Yeah, just just have a look. It's pretty easy. There's even a, a free app where they okay. talk you through um, certain exercises, even while walking, while jogging. Um, you know, obviously just stationary sitting ones and there's a bit of a, like an overnight assessment, how you feel when you wake up, um, this, this, I can't remember what it's called now, um, the bold score. So it's basically like a breath hold, how long you can hold your breath and, and you can actually measure it. So, you know, I think I tried it, say, for example, on Wednesday and I could feel like I was, you know, pretty tired from the weekend because my score was half of what it was say last Thursday. I could, you know, hold my breath for almost 90 seconds oh. where I felt on Wednesday, it was like back to 35 seconds where oh. I felt, oh, I got to breathe now. Otherwise, I'm going to pass out. So, yeah. you, know, you know, you don't want to push too far, but that's a, that's a nice little tool to sort of test where you're at. If you, you know, where your fitness is at, where your calmness is at. Um, so that's certainly something that, um, I've heard about in the past. I've sort of tested it for a few weeks in the past. Um, and someone sort of reminded me of that probably about a, two, a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, and um, got me back onto that. And uh, I certainly I, I did it, you know, two or three weeks be, before Herdies. Um, yeah, and I, I think it did make a difference, you know, when it got a bit hectic or in my mind it got a bit hectic, I sort of got back to it um and yeah I, I certainly need to continue it. it it's you know it takes a few minutes a day um and yeah by now i, I can jog slowly through my and breathe through my nose mm -hmm. um but as when i speed up a bit you know I, I, I need to let the air out through my mouth um i can't do both yet it feels like yeah. it's too much happening yeah, yeah um well look hey um thanks heaps for coming on Johan, and congratulations on your 52 yards. It was really, really great to see you do so well. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, I've obviously listened to so many great guests on your show, um, and it's, it's, it's nice to be on it. Yeah, well, thanks, Heaps. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you do it, No Time to Die. And I hope you make it to the Australian team. Thank you very much. Right. Hopefully I'll hopefully I'll be on that team with you. Awesome. That's <laughs> the plan. All right. Um, we'll stay in touch and all the best. Sounds good. Thank you, Pedro. Right. See you, Johan. Talk soon. See you. Bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, it would be awesome if you could share, comment, like, subscribe, all of that. If you've got any feedback, shoot me a message. Hope you have a great day. See ya.